what is the only mammal capable of flight is the question that I will answer by the end of this show. Before I get into that, I feel like we should give some sort of introduction just in case you're a new listener listening for the first time or you may be someone who has come back like a regular listener. So this is episode 14. Uh, The previous episode that I did, episode 30, I was about to say it. No, sorry. This is episode 13. Next episode will be episode 14. The previous episode did it this episode was episode 12 where I was talking about Pierre Farchard who is the father of modern uh, dentistry I was about to say medicine because it would have like rolled off the tongue very well (laughs) no he was the father of modern dentistry so if you're anyone interested in finding out more about him please check out the previous episode episode 12 and before that episode 11 i was talking about step and fetch it and episode 10 which was the previous episode before episode 11 for anyone who is not on the same wavelength as me <laughs> and in that episode, I was talking about Nikkel Nichols, the Star Trek actress and NASA recruiter. And the episode before that, episode 9, I was talking about Max and Kira's law, which is about organ donation and how the law changed in 2020, in May. <laughs> Sorry. It's a lot of facts to remember. (laughs) But anyway, enough about the previous episodes. Thank you for joining us. If you, this is the first time you're checking us out. And if you are a returning listener, thank you for coming back. And this week's quote is by, well, like last week, this week's quote doesn't actually have a author that I could find but in my process and how I have my process anyway I like to do the research for the quote after the episode for the post that I make on Instagram instead of the other way around seems crazy to some people maybe but for me it's just like more fun it makes making the post that I'm making for Instagram more interesting for me instead of just generically making a post but that's just my process you don't have to do it too (laughs) anyway this week's quote goes like this be thankful for what you are now and keep fighting for what you want to be tomorrow and I really like this quote just in the sense of the the simplicity of it and then also the complexity of it at the same time in the sense of again I guess I feel like I'm on the same waves of being thankful for not just being alive but just for what you are now in the sense of a lot of time or a lot of, a lot of the time, I feel like as human beings, we kind of neglect the achievements that we have made or that we have done. Not that we, um, neglect it as in we don't appreciate things because 
I'm sure a lot of people appreciate the things that they do or the things that they have done. But what I mean is in the sense of everyone's always looking at what other people are doing in comparison to themselves, which is understandably healthy for the whole competition aspect. But I feel like where you kind of are cutting your ears off at the end, I don't feel, I feel like that was not a real saying in my head. Like maybe someone knows like the saying and like while they're listening, they're like, Oh, you you mean this Corey? But right now I, I can't think of what it is. But I'm pretty sure it's something to do with cutting your ears off, despite your face, maybe. Maybe that's the saying. If anyone knows, just send me a message or something. I'm I'm really looking forward to finding out what that is. And even if you don't send me this message, I'm sure I'll look it up after the show. So, but anyway, I feel like we kind of neglect the competition, or not neglect the competition, it's more of a thing of, competition is competition over everything so you neglect your own place in the competition or like your own feelings or like maybe it's just where you are now like I do the same things in the sense of I might be I might push to the side when someone might compliment me about what I've done I'd be like oh no it's nothing but Maybe to me, while I'm thinking about it, yeah, it might be nothing, but other people or how that, how they appreciate what I've done or, or they can validate what I've done. I should be more accepting of that as opposed to pushing it so f- much to the side as if it's, ah, oh, it's nothing. It's not nothing. It's something because you've done it and You've done these things in your life to get yourself to this point where you are now. And maybe you're not happy with where you are. So that's maybe the reason why you might uh, not to decide things that people say or so easily. But you should be more appreciative of these things. Because if other people can see these things in you, these qualities, and they can see the growth in you, then you should see them or appreciate them on the same value level. Not that you should obviously hold yourself accountable to what other people see, but just take it as, take a compliment as it's meant to be received. As it's meant to be. Like, don't just take it on the chin. Take it in. And I'm really not mean, meaning to rhyme with all this, but it's just something that I've like heard in in a retrospect while I'm speaking. I'm just like, yo, this is this is the hardest poem. I'm gonna write this down after the show. <laughs> but oh, it's not unlocking. I miss fingerprints. <laughs> Sorry. And in doing all the fighting that you're doing for not fighting for in doing all the appreciating of where you are what essentially you are doing is fighting for what you want the image of what you see yourself to be in the future or what you can be by appreciating where you are and where you want to go, and then thinking about, okay, cool, I know where I want to get to, and I know where I am now, so now all it is that I need to figure out is the steps or the skills that I need to achieve that brighter tomorrow. So, I hope that this quote empowers you and inspires you and motivates you the way that it does for me or 
that's the way I see it. And that's the way it ta- I take it in for my- myself and my motivation. But maybe there's other motivations or aspirations or versions that you have for yourself that I'm, I'm very interested to hear about. So just make sure uh, your voice is known on the post on Instagram if you have it or on Facebook if you're in the group on Facebook or just on Twitter, just tweet it at my opinion means. Uh, but I'm always open ears. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and opinions. And yeah, I'll leave Monday's affirmations there. So I hope that you got all the nutrients that I intended from the quote that I was delivering. I'm sure there was a, a better word that I could have used there that could have went with nutrients, but plants, plants give nutrients. Yeah. So not that I'm calling my audience plants, but plants give off nutrients. Yes, they do. Um, and so the vitamins, there's, uh, some GCSE science coming, kicking into play in my brain. (laughs) But anyway, enough about the quote. Let's get into the show and talk about William Addis. So William Addis was born in 1734 and died in 1808. And he was an English entrepreneur believed to have produced the first mass production of toothbrushes. So he was born, like I just said, in 1734 in England probably in Clerkenwell in London. And I am aware of this area only in namesake (laughs) in the fact of I've probably seen it on a map somewhere while looking at Google Maps or maybe it's on the underground map, but I'm not 100% sure whereabouts it is. Maybe it's in West London maybe central London, not 100% sure, but I'm very much, I, I, I know that area from namesake, like I said. And in 1770, William Addis was involved in a riot that took place in Spitterfield. For this riot, which he was convicted of inciting, he was put into prison. And while in prison, he, I guess he was, he had a lot of time on his hands. It's not 100% mentioned how much time he spent in prison or like how long he was in there for, but he, I kind of assume that he was in there for around about mm, maybe five to ten years. I only say that because the first mass production of toothbrushes was in 1780, and if the riot was in 1770... And that's when he, that's around the time he went to prison, then for, let me just continue with the story anyway. (laughs) So, while in prison, he was observing how people use brooms and the sweeping motion on the floors. So he decided that the normal method which was used for cleaning of teeth at the time uh, people used to clean their teeth with um, crushed shells or soot on a cloth and I I can only assume that maybe there was water in the process so um 
that's how people were cleaning their teeth at the time. And William Addis at the time, while in prison, he was just like, uh, that doesn't seem very sanitary for me. And this sweeping motion of the brushes on the ground that seems like an effective way of cleaning the floor. So why couldn't the same thing be possible for our teeth? For our, for our teeth? <laughs> That's the teeths. As in like teeth isn't already plural for tooth. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so as if, you know, and I can see the logic to it, the sweeping on the ground, on the brushes, what we do with us when we're sweeping the floor is an effective way for cleaning the floor. So the same could be possible for cleaning our teeth. So as he, Mr. Addis, he believed that the cloth process of washing and brushing our teeth was ineffective. And he spent his time in prison figuring out a better way for the whole process of brushing. So he decided that he would use the handle or make the handle out of bones or out of a bone, which he kind of first fashioned from uh, an animal bone left over from a dinner that he had one night or like the previous night from when he decided to start this process of making the toothbrush. So he had like, say, call it a chicken bone. He had a chicken bone and then he drilled a few holes, I guess, near the top side of one of the bones, of the bone that he was trialing it out with. He drilled a couple holes and they were very small holes in which he then got some bristles from one of his guards and he then tied the holes or used um, threaded um, some of the bristles through the holes that he drilled into the animal bone or like we're calling it a chicken bone right now and uh, then he once he woven them in and tied them and tied them into tufts um, he then sealed it at the end um, to really hold it into place with glue and voila he had it the first toothbrush and after he was released from prison he started a business in manufacturing toothbrushes which he built um and as i was saying in the uh spoiler <laughs> in the f in the first half of the uh, story i was explaining and it was only i went on off onto a tangent on my own mind and i was still speaking out loud and instead of like talking through the script <laughs> and i just went off the script and i was just like wait hang on if he did this this one sorry i was i was working it out but as you were now aware after he was released from prison he started the business and obviously this this business was booming like no one had ever seen anything like this before everyone was cleaning their teeth with uh, a rag of cotton or not even a cotton, a cloth, and crushed up shells or soot. And as I was saying, I assume there's maybe some water in the process, but if there isn't water in the process, then that just means that people are crushing up shells and or, and or soot and putting it on a cloth and then just rubbing that on their teeth, which, I don't know, maybe it worked back then. But 
knowing what I know now and knowing that I have an electric toothbrush and that's how I clean my teeth. But before that, I had a manual toothbrush and that's the only thing I've grown up knowing. So all the dentists say that that's the right way to brush their, brush your teeth. So, I mean, it must be, right? <laughs> we can only assume that dentists know what they're saying when they say brush your teeth with a toothbrush. And the fact that they don't say after your checkup, um, I know you've been using a toothbrush for all this time, but maybe if that isn't working for you and you want to go a little old school, maybe try a cloth and soot and some get some shells and maybe crush them down and use that as your uh mouth care. I'm sure dentists don't call it mouth care either, but <laughs> I'm just being facetious here. Facetious? Is that the correct way to say it? Or maybe is that even the right word to use in that context? Who knows? But that's the word I used. I'm pretty sure it's somewhat on the same wavelength for it to come forth in my brain to be used. Um, but I could have just seen it somewhere. And on later, um, thinking about Clerkenwell, um, also some extra research. <laughs> I've now realized the real and the the reason why I know where Clerkenwell is is because it's in East London, not West London. And Spitterfield, it all makes sense. Spitterfield is I think yeah, that's in East London as well. And it's probably more like East Central is what I mean, as opposed to West Central. I just wanted to clear up my uh crazy initiative that I went on in the beginning when I was saying, no, it's West London, it's Central London. No, nah, it's, it's definitely East London. That's why I've seen it before. Like, around, like, Mile End, Spitterfield kind of areas. But the geography aside, after many, many years, not many, many years, the the company of toothbrushes that William Addis pioneered and invented and created rather um as i said business was booming and after a short while he became a very rich man and he died unfortunately like i mentioned right at the beginning in 1808 but in his death he left his business to his eldest son who was coincidentally also named William Addis. And by the 1880s, um, William Addis Jr. began exporting um, products abroad to the US. And by the time World War II came around, Add is junior employed about 650 people and the first injection molding machine uh, machines were purchased and the first nylon toothbrush was launched under the wisdom brand so for anyone that has been at a uh, I don't know, supermarket? <laughs> Where do, wherever you buy toothbrushes from. Maybe it's the corner shop. I don't know. Whatever's open at this moment in time in a lockdown. Um, so for anyone that's seen Wisdom as a brand, it was originally created by William Addis Jr., who is the eldest son of William Addis, who was the man who created and invented the very first toothbrush. So think about all that history next time you're picking up a wisdom toothbrush. <laughs> so 
he kept this business, the Wisdom Toothbrush brand, stayed in the Addis family in ownership until, I guess, they sold the company in 1996. But it was still under the name Wisdom Toothbrushes. Um, this company now manufactures 70 million toothbrushes per year in the UK. Now, that is an interesting fun fact. So, by 1938, the first toothbrush with nylon fibres were produced. Uh, with, with, which were the reason why this was, it was during the nylon era because, uh, nylon was proven to be sturdier and more efficient than bristles. Um, which is pretty interesting. And in the USA, it wasn't until soldiers returned home from World War Two that they that toothbrushes became more widespreadly used as the standard of practice because they um, put away their, I guess, old-fashioned forms of brushing their teeth with cloth and soot or crushed up shells and they began using toothbrushes and toothpaste which is a fun fact that the first mass production of toothpaste was by the company that a lot of people still use today, Colgate. And this was in 1873. Colgate first mass produced toothpray, uh, for the first company to ever mass predict, mass, pro- uh, mass produce, I got there in the end, uh, toothpaste. And they used to mass produce it in a jar. It wasn't actually until, um, 19, probably until the 1890s, when toothpaste was first started to be used in tubes. So before that, it used to be, I guess, in a jar, and you used to dip your toothbrush in it, or dip a finger in and wipe off I'm not sure, scoop it, maybe there was a spoon for the toothbrush or the toothpaste, I'm not 100% sure how they used to do it back then but like like I said when modern days came in the 1890s, that's when the first form of toothpaste in a tooth in a tooth tube <laughs> in a toothpaste tube was first being used um but also another fun fact about toothpaste is um up until 1945 toothpaste contained soap so now it doesn't i guess <laughs> but they used to think that they needed soap as well in the toothpaste concoction to help clean those teeth you know um, but now it's just fluoride and other ingredients that I'm not 100% sure about, but I use it because <laughs> most dentists that I speak to at work, they say that, um, as long as it has fluoride in it, it's good, right? Um, I'm not questioning them. I'm not saying that they question what they say to me or what the things that they have mentioned about fluoride, but um, I'll just take their word on it, because they're dentists, they've trained for this. But I just think it's interesting to know, um, anyway, that William Addis created the toothbrush, but then his eldest son created the toothbrush 
brand wisdom and also created the first nylon brush a bristled toothbrush which is now the standard of toothbrushes that everyone uses um but yeah i think that's crazy i think that's cool but that's the story and history of william addis and his son william addis (laughs) (laughs) who created the standard of toothbrushes that we now use today um so yeah i think that's pretty cool i thought i would also end this episode off with a few fun facts about toothbrushes or teeth or dentistry or whatever you want to call it or your the human body to do with, like i said teeth <laughs> I don't know how every, how other, if there is any other way that I could describe that. But anyway, so the hardest substance in the human body is actually tooth enamel. Which is a fun fact to know that if you ever so happen to crack your tooth by falling on something then you've managed to crack the hardest substance in the human body or in your human body, which is a bizarre thought. But it is what it is. That's why I guess teeth are in your mouth and teeth are used to eat things because it's the strongest thing to tear through, I guess, anything. But... As I continue through my facts, the next fun fact about teeth is that... Here's a fact about tooth. The tooth is contained in the mouth. Um, thanks for that, Alexa. Though, um, (laughs) I don't remember saying that other than when I just said it right now. So... Sorry, I don't know that. There's that moment where you realise that the device is always listening. (laughs) (laughs) Yo, man, that that, that caught me off guard because I was about to go into the fact and then the device just popped up. When I didn't ask no questions, I was just talking. <laughs> but, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that really caught me off guard. So, the, your teeth actually have its own print, which are kind of similar to your fingerprints. In the fact of every person has their own teeth print or tooth prints that are unique, like fingerprints. And another bizarre uh, fact on from the, <laughs> the the prints, the teeth, the tooth prints, is that every person also has their own tongue prints that has its own unique shape that it shows off so you know that that tongue belongs to a certain person depending on what it prints out when you i guess i don't want to say plaster seam but like i don't know what you would put uh, some sort of cast or that was going in your mouth so like a mold a mold mold so if you were to put a mold over your tongue it would come off with some sort of uh print that was unique to you which is pretty cool, I think. So no two people have the same fingerprint or tooth print or tongue print. But that is even besides from the actual question that I asked at the beginning of the qu- <laughs> the question, the beginning of the show, 
Um, which is the question I'm about to answer now. <laughs> if that wasn't clear to you already, because I was just casually, you know, mentioning it. <laughs> so, what is the only mammal capable of flight? Well, the only mammal capable of flight is a bat. Which I, surprised me because I wasn't 100% sure, or not 100% sure, I wasn't aware that a bat was also classed as a mammal. So, I'm pretty sure I probably did learn this fact at school. But, you know, in my adult life, it's nice to relearn it. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a kind of short one in the fact version. But I just thought it was pretty cool that bats are mammals. So they're like similar to humans and whales that are also mammals and apes, which are also mammals. Um, but that's my extensive knowledge on mammals. <laughs> and, um, but I do have a few interesting facts about bats. Um, so there are more than 1,200 different species of bats in the world currently, which is pretty cool. There's, um, only one human race. <laughs> so like, just to put it in perspective, there's only one species of human, but there's 1,200 different species of bats. Um, bats are the only mammals capable of flight, which is the fact that I questioned at the beginning of the show. <laughs> Uh, bat droppings can be used to make gum powder, which if you think about it, is a pretty explosive poo. <laughs> and the interesting part that I found about it is that uh, bat droppings are also known as guano, which is interesting. <laughs> but the interesting part comes when knowing that bat droppings are high in potassium nitrate, which is also known as saltpeter. Um, so saltpeter is often used as a fertilizer <coughs> um, and can be extracted for use in gunpowder and in, in explosives. And an important resource for the purpose for that purpose was during the American Civil War bat guano um has been found in uh preserved fossils so they used um bat droppings in their gunpowder and explosives during the American Civil War <laughs> Another interesting fact about bats is that not all bats hang upside down. It is a common thing to know or that when we speak of or see bats in cartoons or media, um, bats are usually seen hanging upside down. But fun fact is that um, their feet have evolved to be relaxed in, in, a, clench, in a clenching position, which is difficult for me to imagine um <laughs> just because um clenching is usually <laughs> clenching is usually when you're not relaxed so to think that um a bat has their has evolved that into having their feet permanently clenched and that's relaxed for them so when they have their thing, their uh, feet stretched, that's like actually a stretch for them. 
So when they are ready to fly, they let go and gain momentum from falling. And since their legs and wings can't keep them from that kind of lift, like birds get, uh, so it's different from birds in the sense of they're falling into flight as opposed to being able to create the lift themselves, like birds. They have to fall and then fly up as opposed to flapping to keep them up. So it's also interesting to know that there's only six species of bats that don't hang upside down. But most bats do hang upside down, so. But not all of them, but most of them do. Which is why they're painted that way in the media, I guess, because the majority of bats hang upside down, so. That's how they post them. And the final fact about bats is that bats aren't really blind. Which. It's kind of crazy for me to um, kind of compute. They're not blind. I'm always been told the bats are blind. But in actuality, only a small species of bats use um, echolocation as their main uh, means of orientating themselves. Bigger bats can see better than humans. Sight is blessing, sight is a blessing and a curse, however, because sight can, um, override eco, uh, echolocation signals. For instance, a bat may fly into a window because it sees a light outside, even if echolocation tells it that the surface is solid. Uh, I see. That's pretty interesting. So they are blind, but they're not blind. So smaller bats, smaller bats, smaller bats will probably be blind or not be able to see as well as bigger bats. But that's kind of a hindrance on bigger bats because it means them being able to see overrides their echolocation, whereas blind bats or bats that see very little have echolocation to counteract the fact that they can't see very well. Well, if that wasn't... uh, I I can't think of the word for this, what that was, (laughs) but that was something. That's a... a mind, a, a, a mental gymnastical mind measure is what I will call that. <laughs> and in going with that, um, final bat fact, um, I will call that the end of the show. So I hope that you have enjoyed finding out more about the invention of the very first toothbrush and the man who invented it. And finding out more about bats and the human mouth. (laughs) And yeah, if you have enjoyed this episode, please do listen to other or previous episodes and the next episode, which will be coming next week. If you haven't listened to any previous episodes, but if you have, I feel like I'm saying like a repeated record, something I've said already in the beginning of the side, the beginning of side, the beginning side of the episode, but who cares? I can repeat things. It's my show, isn't it? (laughs) So I hope you've enjoyed this week and there will be more next week. And I'm not going to let you know what I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to let you wait. So until next week, enjoy your the rest of your week. I hope Monday Affirmations helps motivate you into having a better week. 
or a more inspiring or positive week or whenever you listen to this show i hope you know that the more you know the more you grow i'll figure out a proper outro anyway enjoy thank you for listening bye